at this point, it's starting to feel like the Bible's getting bored with itself. So in my Bible, each book starts with a brief essay about what you're about to read. And for First Thessalonians, they were so fucked for shit to fill the space with that they actually felt the need to mention that the title First Thessalonians doesn't actually appear in the original letter. Fascinating. This despite the fact that First Thessalonians is believed to have been authored around 49 CE, which makes it the earliest of all the epistles and by default the earliest known Christian writing. And yet, despite its significance, it's still too boring to merit more of an intro than an academic translation of another boring fucking letter from Paul. <laughs> yeah, but in fairness, I like how they put the letters in the wrong order, but still all clumped together and then added some fake ones. That really yeah. helped push the narrative for me. Exactly. And joining us to discuss what is perversely both the first and last of the Pauline epistles is my lovely wife, Lucinda. Lucinda, what did you think of Thessalonians? It was so short it only managed to bore me to sleep twice. There you go. Well, Definitely an, an improvement. improvement. So uh, why don't you start us off? Well, I guess at this point I don't need to tell anybody how this opens, but I will anyway. Paul spends an inordinate amount of time talking about how awesome God is. And, of course, it just wouldn't be Paul if he didn't try to compliment the people he's writing to by telling them how awesome he is. Yeah, isn't that just a Paul compliment? I'm exactly as awesome as God, and you're almost as awesome as me, and that's pretty fucking awesome. <laughs> Give yourself a pat on the back there for that one. Yeah, it, it sounded like Paul was definitely surprised by how well all the Jesus stuff caught on with the Thessalonians. Clearly, yeah. He was saying, holy shit, did you guys keep doing all the crazy shit I told you about? Because <laughs> I'm hearing about two other cities that started doing it too. And it's that weird moment when a person realizes he's a cult leader and he says, you know what, fuck it, I'm going to roll with this. I'm <laughs> right, I'll blame it on yeah. Jesus long term. And, and, and then he reminds people in Thessalonica to tell all their friends how much fun it is to give Paul food and a place to stay when he comes... Rolling through town, it's pretty good Good time. <laughs> and, of course, he caps it off by reminding them that Jesus will be back any minute now. Well, and, and we open up Chapter 2 with Paul doing his impression of the band that shows up in town and tries to get a bunch of applause, but, like, but just referring to local shit. You know, sure is nice to be back in San Jose. How about the <laughs> moderately sufficient ice hockey team, the Sharks? You know, we, we rolled into town on the I-880 Spur. Yeah. So somebody from Palo Alto, if you know what I mean. Yeah, he says, remember how much better a group of humans you are than those fucking Philippians? Bunch of assholes. Yeah, I had to bring in another dig on the Philippians. Yeah. And then he starts protesting to shit nobody's even talking about. And, and really poorly, too. He's like, you know what's awesome about us? The way we're not a bunch of con artists. <laughs> you know, the, the fact that we're not lying to you about this Jesus thing, and we definitely didn't just make all this shit up so that we wouldn't have to get real jobs. That's what's awesome about this us. This is in a letter now. Right. He even basically says, and you guys all have such rippling muscles and gorgeous dicks that I don't even have to flatter you. <laughs> well, I also you love know? this line. Okay, so recounting his trip to Thessaloniki, he says, we did not seek praise from mortals whether from you or others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you. <laughs> Didn't have to be. So just take that however you care to. Right. And if you're in danger of not taking it homoerotically, we should mention the very next sentence that talks about the precise depth to which Paul loved them. Yes, yeah. Also, they, they, they mentioned stuff. sharing not only the gospel, but themselves. A lot of gay fucking in this one is what we're trying to say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Most so far in any and it, epistle. And it was mostly consensual, so, you know, <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, we're all hyped up on Jesus magic, marauding around. We easily could have raped the shit out of you guys, <laughs> which it is now well documented that we did not. No. That's, that's chapter two in a nutshell. First Thessalonians two. Paul's gang rape alibi. Yeah. <laughs> and here's another theme in Paul's letters. He probably spends the majority of his epistles saying shit like, and if anybody knows what a hardworking, selfless, sexy motherfucker I am, it's you guys. <laughs> he's, he's, he's constantly testifying to his own awesomeness through the person he's writing to. Right. I'm like, Paul, there's a difference between somebody calling you selfless and somebody agreeing with you when you say it. Right. You know, you know that, don't you? <laughs> also, I think we'd be remiss not to bring up chapter 2, verse 14 through 16, which are just loaded with rank Jew hate. Oh, yes. Remember, this is the earliest known work of Christianity, and it lays on the anti-Semitism thick and early on. And, and none too subtly. He basically right. says, 
the problems you face in life are almost as shitty as Jews. <laughs> who are the Jews? Great question. They're the people who, it's already been well established, killed Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Yes. That's verse 15 almost right. exactly. Definitely another one of the spots where the editors decided to plant a gun and sprinkle a little crack on Judaism. <laughs> right. Well, and then he turns it into a cheating lover that isn't even trying anymore. He, he spouts some shit about like, oh, and I was definitely intended to come to your rehearsal, but... Uh, Satan blocked my way. You know, the damn devil, you know, he's always throwing up toll booths in the middle of the desert and shit, trying to get through. Fuck you all up. It was the worst excuse ever yeah, about no. why he couldn't make it to Thessalonica, even though they had clearly made firm plans. Yeah, no, yeah, no, I, uh, yeah, no, I, uh, I really wanted to make it up there for your, your slam poetry German dubstep open mic night. <laughs> but I, I was literally in the cab. I'm on the way over and, and just... You know, out of nowhere, uh, fucking Satan rear-ended us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's no police report or anything, so you can't you can't check on it. But we're all fine. Moving on. Satan. And is it just me, or does Timothy get more than his fair share of backhanded compliments in this thing? Because okay, because chapter three basically opens with Paul saying, "After many attempts to come visit you myself, we settled for just sending Timothy, who, though a pale imitation of my own greatness, is somewhat better than nothing." I mean, okay, think about it. Timothy is generally the one carrying these fucking letters, okay? So he's there when these are read aloud to the congregation. <laughs> and then he closes the chapter with a quick reminder that Jesus is 93% loaded and will be finished <laughs> updating at any second now. Yeah. yeah. Paul's trying to tell these people that all the extreme suffering means the plan is right on track. Yeah. Like this uh -huh. delusional boss with a failing business. I bet you're all getting persecuted and tortured, right? 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 What did I say? This is perfect. <laughs> and when you pray, nothing ever happens, right? <laughs> right, exactly. You guys are crushing it. <laughs> you're doing it right. All is according to plan. All right, so here's my biggest issue with this entire fucking book, perfectly captured at the opening of chapter four. This book is insanely long and boring, and yet at almost no point does it make any effort whatsoever to explain what Christianity is, what they believe, what God wants them to do. That stuff is like an afterthought that you have to infer from snippets of conversation here and there. Right. And this, this whole fucking letter, no effort is made to tackle anything theological or moral mm -hmm. until chapter four. And then when we get there, it's just Paul saying, you know, you should keep pleasing the Lord by doing all the Lord pleasing stuff you guys were doing. Well, he does specify that they shouldn't fornicate. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. But that's it. The entire moral imperative of this letter could be distilled in the two words, stop fucking. Yeah, yeah. And be done. Well, with. and this is one of those spots where the translation really matters, because in mm -hmm. chapter 4, verse 4 talks about how every man should be able to control his own body or control his own vessel or <laughs> be the master of his domain. All depends on the translation. Or his dick or his rod. <laughs> Johnson. <laughs> Johnson? He also tells Christians to mind their own fucking business in chapter 4, verse 11. So as little time as the Bible spends on advice, its devotees still ignore it. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, this guy's impossible to follow. Yeah. First he's saying, master your domain. Then a few verses later, he's saying, work with your hands and mind your own fucking business. It's a mixed <laughs> message. It's confusing. It is. And then we get the meat and potatoes of this book, which is Paul's desperate attempt to explain why Jesus hasn't returned yet. And that was way back when. Well, yeah, I mean, we should yeah. really focus on that one because clearly, 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 as clearly as anything can possibly, as clear as Mike Huckabee's semen, the, the, the book says over and over again that Jesus is going to be back any minute. Now, like within the lifetimes of the people that Paul is talking to, he says that over and over. And over again, yeah. Jesus says that over and over again in the Gospels. It could not be more plainly mm -hmm. stated. It is impossible to read this book without coming away with the definite impression that all the Christians in 49 CE expected Jesus to return within the next few years at the latest. So much so that he spends half of this chapter explaining why some of the people that had converted to Christianity had already died without Jesus coming back. Right. Exactly, and he's, and he's treating it like a broken promise. Right, right. It's also funny how he has to walk this fine line, too, because he's telling them, don't worry, all those dead people still you know, get to go to heaven, but he also wants to make it very clear that the rest of them should still avoid dying, even if it means going straight <laughs> yeah, to heaven. right, right. <laughs> well, it sounds like a little kid changing the rules on the fly during a <laughs> wiffle ball game. No, 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 the ghost runners move up automatically. We, we, we said it's foul from the corner of the shed, but that was a ground rule double because it bounced fair and then hit the first branch. We said that earlier. First <laughs> branch. Also, we have to keep playing with no winner forever. Right. <laughs> right. 
And then he reminds us that even though it seems like life is governed by impersonal forces that don't reward good behavior or punish sin, that's just God being God. You know how he is. Yeah. And, and he yeah. also says to test everything in, in verse 21, mm. which seems to contrast entirely with all the other advice in the book. Right. I have no idea what this is saying. And according to 1 Thessalonians 5.26, you should greet each brethren with a holy kiss, which is kind of strange hmm. because as I understand it, you never go holy to mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. And Big no-no. This is also where Paul describes the upcoming resurrection of the Savior in the rapiest way he could possibly <laughs> think of. He says, if you don't stay awake, the Lord will come inside you like a thief <laughs> in the night. Yikes. He repeats that. And then it's over. The earliest known work of Christianity, and all it has to say is, A, Jesus will be back before you pay off your layaway, mm -hmm. and B, if God wanted you to fuck, he wouldn't have made blue balls so pleasant. Okay, that's it. So <laughs> that's moving right it. along. Second Thessalonians is interesting, and by interesting, of course, I mean insanely dull in a slightly mm -hmm. different way, because it's basically just like First Thessalonians, except obviously fake. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Yeah, apparently biblical scholars are somewhat divided on this one because some of them are blinded by their allegiance to God, but it's mm -hmm. really obvious at a glance that this was written way later. Well, sure, because it basically says stuff like, now I'm sure that 60 or 70 years from now people are going to be reading that letter I wrote to you guys before and they're going to misinterpret the shit out of chapter 4, <laughs> so I better write you this second clarifying letter that might get lost for a while and then show up a couple of decades <laughs> later when there's a lot of contention in the church about what I meant by chapter 4, that last one that I wrote, much in the same way that I wrote this one. Dan, it's pretty obvious early. Chapter 1 of this book is basically the C.J. Worleman version of the opening chapter from the last <laughs> one. Seriously. <laughs> He's got a new book coming out, you know. <laughs> Plus, we get a, a graphic reminder about how, you know, we were serious about that Judgment Day thing. I know I yeah, just uh -huh. described it as a nocturnal rapist scenario, <laughs> but I feel like you guys didn't really react to that. It's actually going to be way worse, like <laughs> fire and brimstone bad. Jesus will rape you with a brimstone if you don't believe in him by the time he comes back. Which is any minute. So get to it. It's or not. Or maybe some other minute in the distant future, but probably now. Okay, not now, but but now. Or now, but, but now. Eventually. Well, and surprise, surprise, that's exactly the potential misconception that this letter is there to clarify. Well, Weird, huh? yeah, and I think yeah. it's interesting, too, that this one refers heavily to the Antichrist, who, if I'm not mistaken, has not been talked about anywhere yet. <laughs> so, like, fake Fort Paul is basically <laughs> saying, well, of course Jesus hasn't shown up. I mean, come on, the, the, the Anti-Jesus isn't even here yet, guys. What? What are you thinking? And by Antichrist, they mean... Somebody's going to pull the exact same shit we just did, and as we now know, you guys are all idiots that listen to crazy homeless people <laughs> ranting about God, so <laughs> right. you know, don't get tricked again. Tricked. Right. Well, don't and, get tricked. And it even implies that you shouldn't listen to all those fake letters from Paul. Right. So, I mean, how the fuck did it take big biblical scholars 17 centuries to call bullshit on this one, right? right. I mean, it basically says, and I'm sure at some point in the future, people will probably write fake letters and pretend I sent them to you, but this letter sure isn't one of those. <laughs> yeah. Beware of vague, ominous warning. Warning, <laughs> warning. Except that. And that. And that's pretty much it. He goes straight to the verbose close from there. And I was tempted to skim over it, but I'm glad I didn't. Because right. there was a bit of Rush Limbaugh haunting in the, the normal farewell there. Well, I'm sure you're talking about chapter 3, verse 10, where yes. Paul reminds everybody that even though Jesus is all about charity, those lazy welfare moms don't deserve shit if they're not willing to bust their asses for it. Yeah, the actual words, anyone unwilling to work should not eat, just seem at least... A little out of place in the New Testament. <laughs> right. <laughs> Only spot I can remember in the book where they directly endorse starving people to death. Whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa. Starving people to death is not the preferred nomenclature. <laughs> Entitlement <laughs> reform. <Please. laughs> Entitlement reform. And then you get to the worst part of the forgery here because it basically says, oh, and while we're chatting anyway, there's one day going to be a guy named Dave that's part of the church, and you'll tell him once that he can crash on your fucking couch and he's just going to stay there for like three <laughs> weeks. Tell your great-grandchildren to look out for that asshole, Dave, because he's a total fuck. Oh, oh, and also, and also, fuck all the people who tell you later that this letter is fake. Yeah, right. This is definitely not fake. I, I mean, that is just barely an exaggeration. This is the actual fucking sign-off on this letter. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 17. I, Paul, write this greeting with my very own hand. Now, I, I should say, 
that much we've seen before because like sometimes he wants to point out that he didn't use a scribe on this letter that he actually wrote it but then it continues with an elaboration that we have seen nowhere else yet quote this is the mark in every letter of mine it is the way i write <laughs> end quote <laughs> Boy, am I me. <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> yeah. In the NIV, it literally ends with, this is how I write. This is how I write. Yeah. Is a phrase at the bottom. In conclusion, I think it's safe to say this entire letter sounded completely normal, just like all his my other letters. <laughs> I'm Paul, and this is how I end letters. Not fake. Paul. Ending my letter. <laughs> Normal. Normal. Inconspicuous. <laughs> Yours way, truly. I'm always. Real Paul. <laughs> Paul. It's me. I, I would just call myself Paul there. Yours truly, Paul. <laughs> so, so for me, the big takeaway on this one is that you can throw out every scrap of biblical scholarship before the 19th century. Really? Yes. Look, there's almost no way to ignore the fact that this letter isn't genuine. It's comically obvious. So anybody who ever read the Bible and didn't say, well, here's some bullshit that snuck in, just wasn't trying. They weren't paying well, attention. And, and that matters in the public discussion about the, the Bible because a lot of apologists like to cast aside everything an atheist says about the Bible because they point out, well, you haven't read all the biblical scholarship and the interpretations through history. Well, fuck that. Right. Like if St. Augustine never said, oh, and we all know Second Thessalonians is nonsense, right? I can basically discount everything he ever had to say about that fucking book. He was not a scholar. <laughs> right. yeah, that's not what scholar means. No. If biblical scholar means, given the Bible, let's see what else is true. That's the opposite <laughs> of scholarship. scholarship right. Yeah, exactly. So with that, we've reached yet another milestone. That's it for the Pauline epistles. So when the Holy Babel returns, we'll start churning through the pastoral epistles. There's 12 of those, but they had to divide a lot of tiny books into even tinier ones to make that happen. So we're going to be knocking that out in five episodes. That plus Revelations makes a Bible, yo. Awesome. Pretty close. Fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. This is great. Only 13 more books of this shit. That's it. <laughs> great. Stratego.